There we go. Good morning, everybody. This is Dennis Wilburn with the Active Trend Traders. Uh, uh, joining us from Zurich today is Michael Bishop. He uh, is back from vacation. I guess he just he just had he he just had to come back for uh, the big down day in the market. And Michael, how are you doing? Well, I'm fine. And it's a week, so uh, I I had time to prepare. <laughs> All right. And then uh, joining us from Dallas, Texas, uh, uh, Mike Traeger. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing well. You're yes. asking. Everything's good. Okay. Well, I know you do, you you're watching what's going on with the market and and basically coming away with I told you so um, because uh, the yeah. Market I I won't say it since you already said it for me. Okay, so let's get going. I want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, taking a little bit of time out of your morning or your afternoon, depending on where you are located, and we'll get going. we got a lot of stuff to cover today, all the materials that we do present uh, on the How to Make Money Trading Stock webinar uh, are for training purposes only, and traders should always paper trade any new method prior to the risk of their own personal capital. And then here is Michael's disclaimer. And uh, uh, Michael is an independent investment advisor for a uh, Swiss wealth management company. And uh, 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 one thing I really like about both Mikes is that uh, they, they do spend a lot of time researching and getting into the, the, you know, kind of the guts of what makes the market work and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you can read, and this is the disclaimer that is required in Europe uh, for Michael. So uh, I want to remind everybody, uh, I, at the Active Trend Trader, I'm very much about helping people, you know, uh, providing training for folks because I want people to become really good fishermen where they can actually go up, pick their own stocks, know where to pick them and all that kind of stuff. Um, we, we started a series this past Wednesday night. We'll be continuing on with that. Um, but it, rather than Wednesday night, we'll be doing it this coming Tuesday, and it's part two on planning for wealth. And it's, and it's uh, basically portfolio building that we're going to be utilizing with strategy number one. And uh, it, uh, it, we're actually getting to see a little bit of that in action today uh, because we have had a couple of stocks uh, hit their stop losses and uh, they weren't working so we fired them and uh, got us out and protecting the capital that we've developed over the last several months so Michael I'm going to get right into Michael has been promising to talk about robo advisors and so here is a little teaser for some of the things he's going to be doing going forward so Michael I'm going to let you Go ahead and talk about robo-advising the defanging experiment. Yeah, it was a kind of a, a project for this year. I started uh, t t about January 2015 um, to, to, do, to, to implement some uh, with uh, so-called fintech or robo-advice platforms I, I came over. And um, I, it, it's really good time. So, so, so year end, and uh, I think night nights was a, the, the right time because uh, I got uh, uh, experiences in in different market uh, situations, and uh, I, um, I I really could could take uh, some time to uh, to work with these tools and. Uh, through Wells, um, it's it's a Swiss portfolio management company. It was founded by a guy who um, who is a pioneer in online shopping, and he made there his money. And then uh, he had a portfolio manager, and uh, they are very successful in. Um, in terms of media attention and uh, clients wanting to try it, I think they are not so um, successful in really uh, in really getting getting uh, big uh, big money to invest. 
and then Wikifolio is a very interesting approach and that's basically you as an expert, professional, retail, investor, whatever, you can basically with one click create your own fund and as soon as you register, as, as you're registered, uh, your track record is recorded that it's totally transparent for all users what you're doing and uh, if users like uh, what, you, what you're doing then uh, they can um, say I, I'd be interesting and as soon as it's, as it's launched I am willed to invest $1,000 or something like that and it's kind of a, a little bit like crowdfunding as soon as you have 10, 10 people or so really willed to invest your money then they create uh, on the stock exchange uh, a little certi certificate and then you can uh, you can trade it. Huh. Um, that, that's really an interesting one and then uh, one which is also from the idea a very interesting one uh, that guy who comes from investment banking they have more an, an international uh, approach. Wikifolio is a little bit too much concentrated on the German market. Mm, okay. But Meet Invest, it's, it's really international, focus international markets and they looked uh, what um, especially academic gurus who were also successful um, portfolio managers, what was their strategy and then they made a mathematical model of it and then you can say I want the US markets uh, to be traded like, um, I think, I, I'm not sure, I think Warren Buffett has not really their style but but there are um, some others that I, I will also then uh, give you there some, 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 some examples um, and, um, and they let it open where you invest. They just uh, kind of deliver, uh, so like uh, like you are doing this. They uh, they um, they send you alerts, and then uh, it's it's your own um, choice. Okay, that's with this one here. The orders, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Okay. And um, I tried all, all three relatively uh, in, um, intensively and um, I mean what I was also curious uh, would they would they bring me to to high flyer uh, stocks and on the other side how how does the rotation work and um, how do they uh, roll between different assets and um, I, am, I, I have not the results in written yet, but uh, I decided to um, to go then through all of three of them and measure. Uh, but stability is it was it something I I like to use. Then investment universum that's. Um, a very important one and this is also um, a very distinctive uh, criteria. Uh, transparency is also an important one for me so that I understand what is what is the tool uh, doing in the background and why. Uh, support, I uh, had contact with all uh, helplines uh, of, of this tool, all three of, of them uh, support because uh, I, I I got stuck uh, somewhere. Then uh, user target group is very different. So I can say true wealth is more for for the uh, investor that has not a lot of uh, experience. And uh, meet invest is is I think that the most uh, advanced one. And costs, of course, is, is important. And uh, finally, at the end of the day, uh, about performance. 
Cool. And so I will. I thought I I, I made my experience. I will uh, summarize them, and. Um, I don't know how, how many people do we have here. One hundred. I mean, if if some some of you uh, tried uh, some some robo advising offers, U.S. offers, um, yeah, I would be happy if you if you drop me an email. And here's and, Mike's uh, email, Michael's email uh, right if, there. Yeah, exactly. So well, Michael, you know, uh, I look forward to hearing now. Universum, uh, what exactly does Universum mean? For instance, um, Wikifolio um, does not cover the US market really well. Ah, okay. So you have some uh, big TFs that are not, uh, that cannot be traded, and uh, that's, that's not good uh, for, for, for 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 my investment style. So so you know you put a question here in the middle. <clears throat> uh, you know how did they do? And did they profit? You know did they take profit of the Fang, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google? Uh, uh, did they take profit of the Fang Euphoria? Um, and so I I don't necessarily want. Uh, you know, a specific answer because I know you're going to be covering that in future <clears throat> future uh, presentations. But uh, uh, and you mentioned that some of them did and some of them didn't. Is that the, is that is that the answer you're going to go with today? Yeah, uh, what, what I can can say, I mean, True Wells they do almost the opposite so, so they try to have always a balanced portfolio and as soon as as some uh, some sub some sectors develop especially well they, they take profit very uh, very uh, okay. Soon. okay and Wikifolio is a totally different story there it depends uh, what you are doing with the tool okay and um, meet invest depends a lot. Gary depends which strategy you choose. Okay, so the answer to the question regarding Fang Euphoria and how well they profited from it is it depends. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. if any of you guys, uh, any of the members, have had some experience with the robo advising uh, concept or, or checked into it and wanted to share with Michael. Here's where you get a hold of Michael and just let him know uh, what your experiences were, because I'm sure he'll he'll uh, pull that into some of the rest of his research. So, Michael, thank you, man. Looks welcome. You it looks it looks kind of interesting. Um, and so let's move to the next. Um, uh, let's talk about what's going on in the market right. now. You know, basically this moment this week, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin Mike Trigger up here in a second because I'm going to talk a little bit about the Fed. Um, but this week, I think we can categorize and just say, you know, this week has been about market weakness. Now, I heard one commentator make a comment to say that uh, uh, he liked that the market was selling off because uh, uh, and, and and his Per, you know, speculation was that the market's selling off because of what the Fed's going to do next week or because of what the Fed's not going to do. Um, and so uh, the S&P right now, what we're seeing is we're seeing levels of support that have been tested numerous times failing. Um, you know, does it need to correct more? Uh, we're the the opinion that if it did correct more, that would that would probably put us into a better position for the next upside move. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know the market's going to correct what it needs to correct. Uh, the the rounding continues, and when you look at a chart of the the Nasdaq, I'll explain what this is talking about. The rounding uh, is a reference to what appears to be kind of a rounding top that's going on. It doesn't mean that we're not going to get tradable rallies in that, but the, that, that, that is something that's going on. 
uh, Russell. Russell broke a major level of support today and appears to be on its way. And the Russell, and we're going to also look at the NYSE uh, a little bit today to see just the, the stark differences between the weighted and the non-weighted indexes. Um, so the outside influences, we're all aware, oil was selling off and sold off very sharply today. And one somebody said, well, uh, you know, the sell-off is because cheap oil is not leading to spending. Now, uh, that may or may not be, you know, true. Uh, but Mike, you, you, Mike uh, Trigger, you made an interesting comment early on about that aspect of, you know, just because you save maybe five or six bucks at the uh, at the pump doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to uh, go out and spend 20 or $30 to prop up the economy, right? Well, yeah, uh, I think it's partially right. I mean, this idea that if, if gasoline prices at the pump dropped, people would have more money to spend on other things mm -hmm. uh, has been in circulation for, for several months. I mean, you know, the first leg or even the first two legs down in oil, we were hearing that. And it was a theory. It has not proven proven it to um, to be a fact in, in reality and you know the rationalization for why that doesn't seem to be happening is that you know when you the station and, and you fill your tank and gasoline prices are cheaper than they used to be so okay maybe you save 10 12 15 dollars on your fill up and if you're doing that once a week, it's you know five six seven hundred dollars a year possibly, but you know that that ten twelve dollars savings pop you know occasionally isn't really that significant, and it's not like you're getting the five six hundred seven hundred dollars in savings in one fell swoop to yeah. to go out and spend on you know a new laptop or an iPad or a TV or whatever, and so. No, you're you're not seeing the gasoline savings leading to um, a, a big turnaround in consumer spending on other items. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not a lump um, it's not a lump sum thing. Yeah. Well, some some of the members are mentioning things such as uh, you know CNBC was talking about housing costs are going higher. Um, Scott says he used to use the money he saved at the pump to go to Chipotle, but because of all the health issues with Chipotle right now, that, that's out of the question for him as of right now. And then also rents are going. Yeah, I mean, what you're saving at the pump, you're spending on the medication to make yourself feel better after eating at Chipotle. Yeah, and you know, and one of the big, you know, I think is one here in the U.S. and 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 Michael, I don't know what they they you know what they're doing there in Switzerland, uh, but you know, for healthcare and all that kind of stuff. But the the new uh, premium for the the Obamacare health insurance, if that's you know where your insurance is is through. It's going up next year dramatically, and the penalty if you don't, you know, uh, get on board the 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 Obamacare bus, also is dramatically going up. That the people are getting penalized when they when they go to pay their taxes, and so it's kind of like a double whammy. You may not be able to, you know, uh, you get washed out of your insurance because it gets expensive, but then you get that double whammy because you don't have insurance. Then you get a, a penalty when you go to pay your taxes and the IRS is just all too happy to try to collect that. Um, so that's, that's, it, you know, just the cost of living while they say, uh, somebody made that said that their healthcare is doubling out of pocket and it's two and a half times higher than it was in 2000. Uh, it'll be two and a half times higher than it was. It, it, it'll be two and a half times higher in 2016. Uh, so the cost of living, while they say inflation is non-existent, I don't know about you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. In, inflation in, inflation hasn't been high enough for the Fed to raise interest rates for the last. Nine or ten years. Yeah, and, and we're also fully employed. Um, 
<laughs> and so I hope everybody enjoys yeah, it. I read I, I saw yeah. a real interesting statistic uh, last night about that, and you, you know, and the point of it was, you know, the the labor force participation rate. When when you start looking under the hood of the unemployment situation, uh -huh. you can get a statistic about how many people are actually not in the labor force yeah. and it's it's a it's a huge number it's like 95 million it is the biggest number we've seen in you know going back to the Carter administration and it represents practically a, a third of the potential working population in the United States and yet and yet, the, the government wants to tell you that the official unemployment rate here is five percent. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and that, that's you know, and so which which is a good segue into the next question is will the the mixed signals that are coming derail the Fed because it was the employment report or the jobs report last Friday. Uh, because they had, were taking a two-week snapshot and said, oh, everything's back in gear and everything looks wonderful. They took a two-week back, you know, a snapshot to say, oh, yeah, we can go ahead and raise rates. So now with the Fed meeting next week is will the mixed signals and the market falling from the sky change their minds and derail the Fed's interest rate hike? Now, we're not going to know that. It's purely speculation until next week. Um, but I, I kind of, in my, in my head, I kind of look at and look at the technicals on the charts, which, um, regardless of what the Fed decides next week, will it lead to further long-term selling that in reality we may not see until, uh, sometime in 2016. So Mike, you got anything good to say about the Fed? Anything good to say about the Fed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think you already know the answer to that. Okay. Um, and no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and again, the most polite way I can answer that question. And so, okay. No, they've they've really they've really blown it this time. And and in fact, for for everybody in the audience that you know reads IBD and subscribes to IBD. Uh, in the editorial section of IBD in today's edition, uh, there's a really good piece written about the Fed and how they've really kind of screwed things up. And, and their monetary policies are, to a large extent, responsible for <clears throat> the poor economic recovery of the last few years yeah. and the growing... Um, income gap or income inequality situation yeah. that has only gotten worse um, o over the past few years yeah. and how it can all be, you know, att attributed to, you know, this uh, zero interest rate policy the Fed's been forcing, you know, for seven years now. Yeah. And so, well, I remember seven years ago, uh, you know, close to eight years ago, we had had a really good study and, and had a presentation on the, on the, the, you know, past economic cycles and, and uh, of the stock market and, and how, you know, certain sectors would get, you know, <clears throat> you know, input, you know, would, would uh, start taking off at certain points in the, the normal economic cycle, and uh, uh, it became very clear very quickly that when the, you know, when intervention started happening, it threw the cycle out of kilter. And so some, you know, then sectors were responding in a big way when they, sh when they were, should have been responding at a later time in the cycle. And so I've got thing, everything out of whack, uh, making it, a little bit more hard to judge. Now, it doesn't mean that the market hasn't done really, really well. And so for traders, we should be, you know, uh, going, okay, it's okay. Uh, or taking advantage of it. So I guess for Michael Bishop, um, on this next point, we know that in the U.S. Uh, uh, indexes, the actual internals and the breadth of the market is really poor. Uh, are you experiencing the same thing over there in Europe? 
what do you consider as internals? So, is it just just the quarterly reports or um, in, internals being be internals being basically where you have just a few stocks that are making you know basically all the headway, but underneath the, uh, okay. underneath the hood, the other stocks that are out there are 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 really performing poorly. So the internal is very good index. point. Um, I asked just exactly the same question myself, and uh, I did not a big study. What, but what I did is just uh, take uh, the two uh, major Swiss indices. It's about it's it's like uh, the S and P and 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 uh, the Russell, mm -hmm. and the result was quite clear. So um, with the, the smaller index, um, we have a quite a well-balanced performance. So there are some, some big winners for sure, there are some big losers for sure, okay. but the median uh, covers the average quite well. Um, with the large stocks, it's a little bit different, but still healthier, definitely healthier than in the US. So, so this, so I think where in the US um, the med median companies uh, had a negative performance, in Switzerland they had a neutral performance. Okay. But I think in That's Europe it's almost the same. And so what does this mean for the future? And uh, I think it, it's more that U.S. is leading the way and not the other way around. Okay. So leading the way in which direction, though? So down. Okay, okay. So. I mean, it was very, very interesting. Yesterday I was uh, at a presentation um, of, uh, of, of a, a major asset uh, management company and there were uh, different uh, professionals, professionals only, and uh, basically the official message of, of the presentation was next year will be a great year again for stocks. Okay. And if you uh, do small talk, what do you do with your portfolios, how do, how do they look like, how, how does your own portfolio look like, you see there is much, much more skepticism. Ah, so, uh, speaking about internals, let's take a look here at the percentage of stocks on the NYC that are above the 20-day moving average. This was from last week, and as we can see for the week, for the, for the week uh, it was basically just middling about 50% of the stocks on the NYSE were above their 20-day moving average, and very quickly things have changed. Uh, in a week's time period, uh, it went from 50%, approximately 50% of the stocks being above their 20-day move, uh, moving average down to today's number, which as the time I took a snapshot of this particular slide, it was sitting about 21.4% uh, below are only 21.4% were above their 20-day moving average, which is definitely a sign of weakness, but also can be interpreted as uh, a potential um, <clears throat> a potential prediction of a turnaround, you know, to happen sometime in the near future. When exactly we don't know. Mike and I monitor some other uh, um, proprietary indicators that we utilize with the early warning alert system uh, and uh, we've got our initial hey warning hey you know get ready but at this particular point nothing has been said to you know that it's time to jump back into the index ETFs or the uh, leverage index ETFs now I know Mike you were taking a look also at the uh, percentage of stocks on the NYSE above their above their 200 day moving average and it now has slipped from about 45 down back down to the 30 level, has it not? Uh, I haven't looked at it today, but that sounds probably about right. It wouldn't okay. surprise me at all. And so, so yeah, Mike and I basically we we uh, did put out a, a, a standby alert on the early warning alert system. But both of us, as we were discussing, we were hoping that we would get a 
a much healthier sell-off, and I know healthy and sell-off may sound a little odd. Uh, however, getting down into this area, because typically when you get the really over oversold uh, conditions, it tends to lead to a uh, a stronger bounce back. And uh, at this particular point, because we're going to get into the other uh, the individual stocks. Uh, right now, I would be looking at it as only being a bounce back, but it could be a potentially good tradable bounce back. So how are things doing as of 9 o'clock this morning? Last week, the Dow was down about 0.7. The S&P was up 6, 0.6, 10.3 on the NASDAQ, and 2.49 down on the Russell. Um, as I said, what a difference a week makes. The Dow is now down as of 9 o'clock this morning, about 2.82%. The S&P... Uh, you know, slipped from positive to negative for the year. The NASDAQ gave up about 3% of its gains that it had last year or last week and going through into last week. And then the Russell down 6%. Uh, Russell really hit the accelerator falling to the downside this morning. And let's take a look at some charts. Now, Mike, I do have the, um, I do have the, um, monthly charts available if you want to make a point of the monthly charts just want to let you know that but let's take a look at what the s p is telling us here's the s p and as we can see here was a swing low that um, you know from a pure technical standpoint we had a swing low comes back up to a another swing high however this swing high is lower than this swing high uh, which is a sign of weakness and today we get a break below the swing low from a pure, uh, purely technical standpoint, that's telling us that, okay, the S&P now is back into at least a short-term downtrend. We don't know how long that's going to last. Uh, but as, as we can see, over the past about two weeks, the, the wide daily swings was telling us that uh, uh, this was a market being swayed primarily by emotions without a lot of, of um, uh, structure or anything concrete to build off of. Had a pretty the nice run up earlier uh, from uh, September. That was pretty uniform and pretty controlled. But then over the past couple of weeks, as we've moved closer to the Fed's decision, things have got a lot more wide and loose. You can definitely see that on a weekly chart where uh, four, five weeks ago, we got the big sell-off week followed by a big up week followed by a do-nothing week, followed by a, a, a wide range do-nothing week. In other words, it closed about where it opened for the week. And this week right now, if we stay where we're at, this is a downside move and it is breaking through the support level. On a weekly chart, and this is what I'd be paying attention to right now, the, the momentum on the weekly chart is going down. Uh, on both the TSI and the uh, momentum indicator, which can be telling us that, um, you know, and, and is evident by the price action this past week, momentum is coming out of the S&P. Um, same thing here on the, on the daily chart. The t true strength indicator has turned over. And also we cross below the zero line on the momentum, which is, tends to mean, hey, we are now in a, a, a short-term downtrend. And let's take a real quick look. Mike, you want to talk about the uh, anything you see here on the – the this is a weekly on the left and a monthly on the right. Well, I think the weekly and the monthly do a, a much better job of um, – presentation you mentioned uh, sort of a rounding top forming in, in the indexes mm -hmm. and you can really get a feel for that on the weekly chart and and a little bit of a feel for it on the monthly chart but the most significant part of the monthly chart those who are listening in who weren't able to on, on Wednesday evening we talked about the divergence the negative divergences on uh, uh, you know very notable negative divergences on the monthly chart of, of the indexes, and um, and the last time that we saw a similar type of situation set up was back in around 2001, when all the dot com stuff was getting ready to blow up, and the monthly charts then looked very similar to what the monthly charts are looking like now. 
I mean, back in, um, actually it was in 2000, where we saw, you know, the S&P sort of hanging out around that 1500 level and it kept pushing against it and pushing against it. And this went on for you know, six, seven, eight months. But at the same time, the, the divergences were becoming very evident. And we can see in hindsight <clears throat> how that followed through. Uh, and, and that's not to say it's going to follow through to the same magnitude this right. time that it did back then. But the setup is, you know, almost identical. Yeah, yeah, because we noticed that both now and also I wish I could get rid of that. Anyway, it won't get out of here. Hold on a second. There we go. Uh, we also noticed something very similar when we move. Let's move forward slightly. And we and here's the 2007-2008 uh, time frame. And one of the things we mentioned was where the, the uh, you know, the uh, bear market back in 2000-2001, in, uh, the eight-month moving average worked very much as a, as a uh, line of demarcation. When the prices would get back up to it, it would fall again. And it did that only once, twice in, this is a monthly chart, uh, with the fall uh, in 2007-2008 time frame, but we were starting to get these indications that hey, things are 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 slipping uh, away. And again, we're getting a similar type of situation now. Does that mean it's going to fulfill to the downside? You know, we don't know. I mean, right now, uh, as I mentioned last night, when we look at a uh, a chart and we're talking about anything that might happen out here. Yes, we have precedents. We have um, the probabilities based on past uh, chart patterns. Um, but anything to the right of this month's, you know, candle or this week's candle, yeah, at the you know, is always, you know, conjecture. Um, even though the patterns themselves do, sh you know, provide us a uh, a certain level of certainty based on the probability and the type of pattern that is showing up. So good stuff, Mike. Yeah, I know. Well, exactly. We're dealing with probabilities and, and past occurrences. And uh, I, I mean, the, the setup is there. And, and I think the setup is highly predictive. Um, you know, keep in mind that, that a monthly chart is, you know, every candlestick rep represents one month and it takes time for things to develop. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the weight of this chart, you, you know, the the amount of data that's included in it and the significance of the divergences that are, that are setting up can really weigh down on, on the shorter time frame charts like the, the weekly and the daily. And um, I believe we're beginning to see some evidence of that kind of downward pressure or downward weight exerting itself on, on the shorter time frames. Yeah, and I'm going to just throw up really quickly here a non-weighted, this is the NYSE. Um, and as you can tell, I've got the fibs laid in there. It got up to a, a, a retracement from the, the high of the year to the low of the year so far. The retracement, the 61.8, just a little bit over 61.8% retracement, didn't hold it on a weekly chart. And then it has fallen back down, broken the 50, and now has broken the 38.2. Uh, and appears... So at least going to be down and down here to retest at 23, and we may be looking at a round trip here. Um, but the NYSE and the Russell non-weighted indexes showing similar type work where uh, the weakness that we've been talking about is very evident here. And, you know, the NYSE has several thousand stocks, and, of course, the, the Russell has Russell 2000, uh, 2,000 stocks that, you know, may provide a um, in you know, a, a look inside the small cap companies that often try to drive the uh, U.S. economy. And so, okay, let's move back one. I just... Uh... One hint, if you want to look to a chart, for me the chart of the day is uh, the uh, JNK, that's the Junk Bond ETF. 
Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it was good. it was quite. So it looked quite really, That's a really good point. Uh, it looked quite dangerous uh, for the Whoa. whole year. Ah. Today it crushed. It really. So what we're saying is this is not a vote of confidence. Yeah. <laughs> is that correct? Okay. So may, maybe I think all this resource related stocks are just giving up. Yeah. Now, giving up. Yeah, and, and I'm going to take a slightly different view of this, guys. Is is just you know looking at this from a, from a purely technical standpoint is this looks a lot like a capitulation move, a hard sell-off yep. to the downside, which could, in fact, you know, after the Fed raises rates next week or doesn't raise rates next week, which could lead to, hey, we're gonna things aren't as bad as what we thought they were, and lead to a bounce in in the junk bonds. Just a thought, which in fact could lead to a bounce in the uh, indexes, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a good point, and and, and I do believe, yeah, I, I do agree. This could be a, a, some capitulation selling here today and this week, and you'll get a bounce uh, back up at least, you know, to, to the shorter term moving averages on both of those charts. Yeah, but uh, the strength of that downtrend and the uh, dichotomy or divergence between, you know, the the junk bond index or, or yeah. the junk bond ETF and the equity indexes is really, really market. And we've talked about the junk bond uh, ETF before, Dennis, in other yeah. presentations. And so, uh, weekly chart on the NASDAQ, uh, we've got the uh, true strength rolling over. Now, normally, when it rolls over like this, you've got some additional potential downside. How much downside, we don't know. I mean, we've got some support here at the... Uh, Oh, just about the 4,400 level. We've got also some support on the NASDAQ, which you can see the NASDAQ has held up better than the S&P and the Russell. Uh, we also have the support here at the 4,495 level and the longer term 40 week moving average moving up. But it became very clear when we started making these, you know, retesting these highs here, when the weekly momentum started falling off, it was trying to tell us, hey, you know, this is, you know, a bear market that is has you know is kind of running out of steam. It's been in place for a long time. Same thing uh, as we say. Nice divergence on a on a daily basis. Also, as we move back up and hit the old highs, and then we're getting you know the finally the selling. But will it stop here, or will it go below that below this swing low like the other indices have? Uh, to set up, hey, I'm and tell us that I'm now in at least a short-term downtrend. So, and again, this could be if if the commentator who made this statement that the selling we're seeing right now is just in preparation and get it out of the way before the Fed, so then it can rally after the Fed. I mean, they may have a point in their in their speculation, but at this point, I'm not taking a bet on any of the indexes at yet. Uh, will we take one soon? Eh, there's a pretty good pop possibility of that. Here we are with the Russell. Uh, the Russell broke the 1140 level. And so there's a couple of things we can do here uh, is measure from 1200 to uh, 1140. That gives us about 60 points. Well, another 60 points from 1140 uh, would actually take us down to the, oh, the 1080 level. If I, if my, did I do my math right, Mike? I think I did. Uh, yeah. Hey. Yeah, this time. <laughs> and so, <laughs> we actually, take us back down to this old support. Um, you know, but from a technical measurement, that is the downside target. Now that we have a break below, and as long as we get the close below the 1140 level, that gives us our target on the Russell down here. Now, is it going to go there in one day? No, not necessarily, but it you know it made jigger jagger around here until it finally bottoms out here. But clearly, like the NYSE, the non-leveraged Russell, or not lever not leverage is the wrong term, non-weighted Russell is way underperforming the other two indices. 
and uh, and oftentimes I know the research that Mike and I have done in the past, you know, over the over the over the past 10 or 15 years, we've always noticed that the Russell tended to outperform, but maybe that outperformance, Mike, was really really tied more significantly to the interest rates than we might have given it credit for. Yeah, well, interest rates are a huge factor on stock prices in general. And, and you know, over very long periods of time, uh, small caps do tend to outperform large cap stocks. Uh, we also know that the Russell tends to serve as a leading indicator yes. for the larger cap in and, you know, leading works both ways. I mean, it can lead to the upside and it can lead to the downside. Yeah. And we've been seeing over the past few months, I mean, going back to August, um, you know, the Russell has been living below its 200-day moving average. And, and yeah. the 200-day moving average declining. You know, that is a um, characteristic of, of a downtrending or, or bearish market that, you know, certainly we have not seen with the NASDAQ and the S&P. And I believe that in that characteristic, uh, the, the Russell has been leading the others. And at some point, that relationship reconciles. And uh, maybe we're starting to see the beginning of that reconciliation, you know, now. Okay. And so, uh, for everybody to, to just take a look here on the weekly chart of the Russell, this big hammer that happened back on the week of 928, uh, from the top of that all the way down to the bottom of its wick is a zone of support. Because the wick of big hammers like this, or any hammer, tends to be a, a, a zone of support. So, Anything in there. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting, uh, uh, Mike and Michael, is that as we're driving down to make new lows, our true strength indicator, our momentum indicators haven't turned over that significantly in the Russell. Yes, we, you know, that was, it is falling off. And so if the Russell does get down into this 1080 uh, level, it might, and, and again, this is a, a this is something that we might see, is the momentum actually put in a positive divergence, and the true strength put in because it could roll down to here, as it's down in here, and then put in a positive. But that hasn't happened yet. But but with the huge sell-off that's happening this week in the Russell, and the lack of really strong movement here. Um, I just find that that's interesting, uh, and at this point, but I, I'm I'm seeing that that could potentially happen and and provide a, a at least a short term setup for a, a move back up. Now, does that mean it's going to race back up and take out the 1200 level and and go on to a you know huge new rally? You know, pro, you know I don't know, uh, but I could see that kind of a setup in. Either you know the next several weeks, we'll, we will see, won't we? And so, okay, that's it for the markets. Uh, Michael and Michael, Mike and Michael, thank you. Let's get on to the rest of the slides. And um, so, the path of least resistance. I thought this was a really good snapshot uh, of a trader this morning on the, uh, at one of the indexes that he's just going, oh my gosh, what's going on? I think he was an oil futures guy or something. Um, so with the active trend trading, we have been really focused the last several weeks on on uh, strategy one and working on uh, portfolio building. We will continue on that path. Um, uh, if you have not had an opportunity to go to the website and take a look at um, uh, I sent out a, uh, a note uh, for, for premium members and early warning members uh, to take a look at the training I did for the Bay Area Moneymakers last week. Um, but if you would like to have access to that, let me know and, and send me an email. And uh, I think it's, it's valuable. One of the things that I found and just kind of discovered both about myself and also about oftentimes other, you know, other traders is that uh, – we haven't really been trained that well in developing portfolios. 
Now, I'm not saying the buy and hold portfolios you're going to hold forever and, and give to your grandkids. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, work, working portfolios on a month, on a yearly basis based on really strong um, um, growth stocks. Um, and so um, a really good uh, trader gave a presentation to, to us a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. And I just got to really thinking about that. I said, we focus so much on trying to just trade single stocks or trade single options that um, we may have missed the, the forest for the trees. And oftentimes the actual huge wealth is generated by by you know, developing a stable of stocks that are working and the ones that stop working, you fire them and get rid of them and replace them with better, you know, you know, stocks that are working. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're working towards. So pillar one, what to trade, when to enter, when to exit, what strategy we're going to use and what to expect. Uh, we base the active trend trading as the foundation and then we add, add to that several different strategies uh, uh, to trade off of. Here's where we finished up. Uh, this is both closed and open accounts. We're up a little bit from where we were last week. And then, um, as I pointed out last week, um, <clears throat> Mike Trigger and I had a, a discussion at the, towards the end of August to say, what's going on? And what we found out is that uh, some things that infiltrated the system that got us away from trading the eight-day moving average the way we should be. And so, uh, um, and once we got back to that, the results started taking care of themselves. And I thought that was very interesting. And so I've added to this an another chart that actually is just the cumulative of all of these, uh, plus the open open positions in the account. To uh, and this I think shows it very dramatically what has taken place in, with our active trend trading over the past year. And uh, it's very significant to see what happened after August in September, October, November, and going into December. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but here's the type of stra strategies, what we've been looking for. S CBM, we are still long this stock. We did sell out a half a position for a nice profit, but we're basically, we're taking bounces off of the eight day moving average. Uh, when we get a close above, then we're, we're planning our trades around that with conditional orders. Uh, for the folks who, uh, you know, are out there with a job and, and can't watch the market on a regular basis, we put those in ahead of time and then let the trade take care of itself. And even with uh, what's interesting, even with today's um, uh, sell-off, uh, hard sell-off, CBM is still hanging in here just a little bit below 52 uh, which uh, it's in about 51.46, and so given the sell-off, it's turning out that it's it's a uh, uh, a growth stock that is hanging in there, and those are the kind of growth stocks you look for when the market's going through the uh, through what it's going through today in this past week. Uh, in 2016, we'll be putting out details of this. Uh, in a little bit, but we'll be focusing. I'm going to provide some training for focus training sessions for small groups, uh, no more than 10 people, but more details will be out on that. And um, uh, we do have the early warning alert update posted to the website and on YouTube. So I thought that bringing this cartoon back out was appropriate. Wild ride, probably not over yet. So please keep your hands and arms inside the ride at all times. Uh, in January, the standard, the basic uh, 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 membership fee on the Active Trend Trader will be going up. Uh, however, you can lock in right now at a reduced level. If you are listening to this video or watching this video uh, or live, you can for both the early warning alerts and the uh, Active trend trading membership. You can lock in both of those for a nice discount and uh, those prices will stay in effect as long as you maintain a membership. And you can find that at this website right here. So with that, I want to see you guys next week. I will be in Arkansas moving my mother into a 
and an assisted living place. Uh, but uh, uh, I w we will go ahead and have the, the session next week. I don't know. Let's see if it's 10 o'clock when we start in California. I'll, I'll be doing it at, tw yeah, well, uh, at 12 o'clock Arkansas time. So, okay. Uh, Michael and Mike, thank you very much. You can either hang around or, or uh, we're going to take a look at some stocks. Yeah, Mike Trigger already bugged out. So we have a little bit of time to look at some stocks, guys. So what would you like to look at? IMAX. One thing, when you focus on growth stocks, growth stocks do show a little bit more volatility than um, um, than the other uh, um, the non growth stocks, and so when the market does do go into a correction or into a sell off, the growth stocks tend to go with them. Aaron, what are we seeing with um, IMAX? What I'm seeing basically is uh, it it basically came up and and after it made this high here. That basically provided us a downtrend line. And so what we've got going on here is a little bit of a cup and handle type pattern. Uh, now one can wait for the traditional, would be, which would be breaking above this level here. Or you can start looking for, okay, it's closing below the eight-week moving average. If it moves back above that, that might be an indication that that's an early entry opportunity. Uh, if it doesn't close back above that, you just wait before it to uh, continue to track down. It is sitting right on top of the, uh, the um, 100 and 200. You've got a, a combination uh, moving average there. And so on a daily chart, I'd be looking for basically a move back up here, back above the eight, but I'd want the eight to be moving back up here. I would like to see volume on any move up from here. Increase somewhat, doesn't have to go you know, way high, but I'd be looking for that. And um, it looks like it's getting in a good place with regarding the true strength indicator because uh, because um, the, you know, moving back above the eight and then a retest of the eight, when it's happening, when the true strength indicator is down below the zero line and the, uh, and the uh, momentum is down below the zero line, that oftentimes is you know, one of the primo times to, to enter the trade because it has the, the greatest upside. When we do enter up here, it doesn't mean they can't work, but when we regain the eight and take back off, um, that's why we keep our stops very close on these, is these uh, trades up here, um, the potential to the upside is a little bit re is reduced somewhat. Uh, but again, it doesn't mean that it can't work, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and don't work because we know they do. But uh, it's these second, you know, second hits the first couple of times off the eight. Uh, they can lead to your really big gains. And so that's what we'll be looking at. I'm going to put out a, a, a video uh, probably this weekend that talks a little bit about, about the three phases of the eight. Uh, and... Um, which ones are, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the A position, the B position, and the C position uh, to give you a, a flavor for what can be expected in utilizing the eight day. Calm. Keep calm and carry on. Okay. Calm has. Okay. On a weekly chart, Com has put in one, two, the left shoulder and a right and the head of a, a head and shoulders pattern. Uh, it's looking for where it's going to start its right shoulder, and, it, and that may not come to fruition, but that's what it appears to be right now. We are breaking back. You know, we broke this swing low after two attempts at a you know to push back up, back up to these highs. It's failed. And so now that we've broken back below the 50, to me, calm looks like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, it's it's uh, a good candidate to go onto your short list. 
uh, until it can, it, it may very well come back in here and do some consolidation, Jonathan, in this area here. As we can see, it's trying to consolidate there. And so if it does some consolidation, becomes constructive, and then starts to build back up, then, <clears throat> excuse me, then that would be, uh, that would change our outlook on the, the stock itself. But for right now, uh, since it's broken down pretty hard on large selling volume, uh, I'd be looking for a little bit more downside and I'd be looking to short whenever it got back up around the 8 or the 20-day moving average. And if you're long this stock, uh, calm, um, well, you should have already been out of the stock. before it started to really melt down. Uh, LinkedIn, hold on just a second, please. LinkedIn uh, is one of the leaders on the um, uh, IBD, I think 50, I believe it's on the IBD 50. I know it is on the leaderboard. And it is looking for where it's going to make us turn around. Will it turn around here at the 50-day moving average? Uh, you know, we'll see. I'd be looking for LinkedIn to, you know, if uh, I this is on my watch list to be watching, and it has been melting down. What's it going to do over here? Is it has it come down and going to start to build up on the right hand side, and then retake out the eight, the true for the longer term trades uh, with the TSI below the uh, below the zero line, the momentum below the zero line. I'd be watching to see, okay, are we going to respect the 50 at 230 and then start doing consolidation here and eventually start building back up? And it's going to go the way the market, you know, the way the market goes. And so it could strengthen up. Um, it is testing down into this gap up from earnings. And typically the midsection of that gap up is the strongest level of support for a potential bounce. And we haven't gotten there yet, but um, the 50-day moving average may uh, replace that midsection of the gap uh, as the strong level of support. So, folks, i got time for one more stock. And so, okay, a couple of ones that uh, just real quick, uh, I, I chatted about it, and I'll throw up a couple of names here that are looking interesting. Um, and one of them is uh, CBM. This is one I was saying that, that uh, even though it it uh, it you know it's here's today's price action. It has not sold off with the market. It has respected the 20-day moving average, and it appears to be trying to push back up through the 20. The true standard indicator appears as if it wants to bounce off the zero line, which would put it right back up into its uptrend. So I'm liking that. I'm also liking, um, I'm also liking Hawk, which, uh, <laughs> has been an exciting ride. Um, but Hawk 2 is doing one of those. It, it looks like it has found support just above where this past uh, highs were here. Found support there. If it can push back above the, uh, the 8, which is very critical, and hold the 8-week moving average, uh, it may um, be some, you know, a, a stock to look at. Wyan Air... You would think Hawaiian Air would benefit from lower uh, uh, price fuel. Uh, it's putting a nice flag back down to the 50. Let's see if it bounces back above the 8 and takes off back up to the uh, towards you know the the uh, moving average envelope, which that would be about a 10% move if it moved uh, back up to the envelope from where it's at right now. Uh, needs to get that close above the 8. And then a couple of ones that we got whacked out on this morning, SMR, or CMR, CRM. Uh, it is getting a rebound now, but this gap down and then rush down, hit the 4% stop loss, and we were gone out of that one. It stopped working for us. 
it may, and we'll watch what happens with the TSI and the momentum and this longer term over here to see where it's going to find its support and turn around. CRM is, uh, this is Salesforce, is a good, still a good, strong company. And then the other one that uh, actually just uh, will wait for it to settle out and hopefully get the TSI down a little bit lower. Uh, found support at the 20, but it hit its stop loss today also. Uh, it is working up against this downtrend line, and so uh, the uh, um, it just the market kept uh, uh, AKRX uh, Acorns from moving on up and breaking out of that line. Purely market related. So, okay, with that, guys, uh, Michael, I'm going to call it a day, and thank you all for joining. Have okay. a just one sentence I can uh, I can uh, read for you. I got a tweet. For every junk bond that had its rating boosted this year, you have been downgraded. A ratio <laughs> okay. not seen since 2009. Ah, 2009. Interesting. So yeah, the uh, yeah the companies out there they're they're struggling. Uh, even though even though you know the news would have us think that they weren't so hey have a great weekend everybody uh we'll get the uh, traders report out on sa sunday or hopefully maybe even uh, saturday uh have a great weekend uh, god bless everybody mike have a great weekend okay have a great weekend Thank bye thanks michael